Hi everyone, in today's video I want to talk about brands of oil paint. There are a lot of videos here on YouTube ranking all of the popular brands of paint in terms of absolute quality, going from the minimum viable student grade paint all the way to very expensive premium brands. I actually just got like a big order of paint in to get me through this time where we're all self-isolating and hopefully not venturing out to the art store unnecessarily. I thought it would be cool today for me to one, just kind of like clean off my palette and put some of these out. And while I do that, I want to talk about my favorite brands and what my go-to tubes of oil paint are. So what I'd like to talk about today are the best three oil painting brands for all Prima painters that represent a balance between quality and value. Brands that are workhorses for top artists and should be workhorses for you too. Now before we begin, I want to provide a bit of an overview of like the different levels of paint quality. Um, Kind of on the bottom tier, you have student grade paint, which is some pigment, some binder, and a whole lot of filler. Um, and then at the top end, you have premium grade paint, which is just going to be your pigment, your binder, and then maybe a little bit of a stabilizer if a particular pigment calls for it. And then in between, there's what's called artist grade paint, which might have some filler, but is generally much higher quality than student grade and not as expensive as premium grade. But this is kind of a simplistic view of the different paint tiers. So some student grade paints still have a really high pigment load, for example, while some premium brands, while being really high quality, just may not have the working quality that you're going to want for your painting. So there is no hard and fast rule, which is why I wanted to make this video. In my experience, the best artists tend to stick to these three brands, at least all of Prima artists who are working professionally. Um, and those three brands are all considered artist grade. Um, they are Gamblin, Windsor Newton, and Rembrandt. Every now and then, certain colors may come from a premium brand. I have a couple tubes of Old Holland, Michael Harding, um, and a few others in my kit. But by and large, these three brands are the workhorses that do the majority of the heavy lifting in my palette. Now I'm just kind of going through, I'm cleaning up old piles of paint here. Some of them are on the fresher side, so I'm going to leave those and probably kind of scoop them up with a palette knife um, and like put them back down later just to give you kind of an insight into what's going on with my um, my prep for today, you know, getting my palette ready for painting. I'm going to be finishing up um, this particular portrait that you can see. Um, and in the meantime, I want to talk to you about kind of the trends I've noticed with those three go-to brands of paint. And after I walk through those, I'll be walking through my palette and I'm going to show you which brands of paint correspond to which color, and where necessary, I will talk about why. So first off, I want to talk about Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt is a brand made by Talons, and it's known for having a creamier texture and beautiful transparent pigments, especially. I use them most notably for the transparent oxide colors, and I really like the creamier texture as a general rule as well. So I have some colors that aren't necessarily transparent, but I just, I like how the Rembrandt paint feels, so I opted for a certain color in that brand over, say, Windsor Newton or Gamblin. Next up, we have Windsor Newton, which is kind of like, when in doubt, this is what I'm going to be picking a color up in. I've heard from other artists that Windsor Newton tends to be kind of hit or miss depending on the color. I typically go by specific color and brand combinations that are recommended to me by other artists. So I haven't personally had an experience where I was like frustrated with, um, with the Windsor Newton color, but I did just want to mention that in case maybe you've had that experience. I definitely want to validate that if it's something that you've encountered. So Windsor Newton is my go-to for cadmium red. Um, 
that's kind of a byproduct of Richard Schmidt's Ala Prima. He recommends cadmium red rather than using cad red medium. My understanding is that there could be a very slight distinction there. So given that Windsor & Newton is the only brand that happens to offer that specific color, that is what I went for. And I have stuck with it ever since. Additionally, I get my permanent rose and permanent magenta, which combined make up my alizarin crimson alternative. In the case of alizarin crimson, there were issues of permanence, which made me gravitate toward alizarin permanent, but I later learned that we don't really use primaries correctly as painters. We tend to think of something like cadmium red as um, a true primary when that's just not really the case. I actually updated my palette to use permanent rose or permanent magenta as the actual true red primary. So I can actually mix alizarin crimson using permanent rose or permanent magenta. Next up is Terra Rosa. I want to say at some point that Ala Prima recommended getting Terra Rosa from Rembrandt, but I have not actually ever found that color in that brand. So. My Terra Rosa is just from Windsor & Newton because that is the only brand that I've found offering that color. Then Yellow Ochre Pale. So this one is really specific. Um, I was once in a workshop with Erin Westerberg, whose work I will link in the description box, um, and we were doing a Zorn palette workshop, and he was really particular about which yellow ochre we used for our palettes because Basically, any brand except Windsor & Newton Yellow Ochre Pale um, was just too dark. You could not mix the full range of the Zorn palette if you were using anything except Windsor & Newton Yellow Ochre Pale. So that is one where I do not even entertain the possibility of going to another brand. It's Windsor & Newton all the way. Okay. And so that's Windsor Newton. Next up is Gamblin. Gamblin is my go-to for a couple of specialty colors like green gold, which is an easier defined version of Rembrandt's transparent yellow green. I also go to Gamblin for a color called transparent orange, which mixes beautifully with blacks and blues to make warm translucent greens. And while I don't have any of these colors on my palette right now, I've also enjoyed Gamblin's radiant line and I also just really appreciate all of the work that they've put into enhancing the safety of all of their pigments. Um, they have really great information on their website, so I, I enjoy supporting them as a brand even though I'm not... I don't actually think anything you're going to see me put out today is going to be by Gamblin, but that doesn't mean I do not really support their brand. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Radiant line. The Radiant colors are, I believe, all pigments that are mixed with safflower oil rather than linseed oil. I believe an earlier formulation of this actually used poppy oil, um, but they've since updated it because I believe safflower oil is less likely to discolor over time. The whole purpose of the Radiant line is to create tints that aren't lower chroma. So color mixing is not a perfect science and what tends to happen is as we introduce white to any of our mixtures, they become inherently less chromatic, more so than is physically necessary um, in terms of just the physics of how light works. The pigments are inherently limited and so as we go toward white, a lot of the color vibrance tends to die, which can be a really big problem if you like to work on really high key pieces. So the Radiant line was formulated to basically just have tints of common colors that don't often tint particularly well. Um, I haven't done a lot of experimentation with this, but I have spent a lot of time using their Radiant White. And the reason for this is that I, I've been on the hunt for a really long time now for the perfect titanium white. And that's basically what radiant white is. It's a titanium that's bound in safflower rather than linseed oil. And the reason I was interested in this is that titanium white for me tends to be exceptionally stiff to the point where with some of my softer brushes, um, it's just not strong enough to actually 
pick up and manipulate titanium white easily. Whereas like any of the Rembrandt colors, they tend to be creamy enough that I can manipulate them with those softer brushes. But titanium white is just a stiffer, more problematic color I've found. Now, it used to be that all Prima painters overwhelmingly loved the consistency and the texture of Lafranc titanium white, um, but the company stopped making paint about a year ago and it sent a lot of painters in my little niche into a total panic. There were a whole lot of really interesting but incredibly lengthy threads on Facebook of people sharing their preferred replacements for Lafranc's titanium white because the Lafranc titanium white represented this perfect blend of a high quality white paint that was creamy and easy to manipulate and no one could find a white that seemed to replicate each of these qualities. I had actually never tried Lafranc so I can't speak to what the truest substitute is but there were all kinds of threads of people comparing every white under the sun from every brand and every formulation. And white is especially tricky as a color because it's really prone to just having problems over time. So any color white can be prone to yellowing and other formulations of white like zinc or lead are prone to cracking or just have toxicity concerns respectively. So there's actually a blog post that's gotten passed around quite a bit with regard to this conversation and I'm going to link the full post in the description but just for now what I want to show you really quickly is an image of of what the blog post talks about. This is just one section of the test, which aged a whole bunch of different brands of white paint for five years. And as you can see, there are some premium brands of paint here that just don't hold up. Either they turn yellow or they turn orange, or it's just, it's not something you want to have to worry about for your paintings. And part of the whole reason I wanted to make this video is to demonstrate, and I think this particular image in this blog post does a really good job of supporting this argument that just because you spend a whole lot of money on paint, it doesn't mean that the paint is going to do what you're looking for it to do. So this nicely brings me back to my general thesis that we're talking about today, which is that just because a paint has more pigment does not mean it's better for your particular task. And the same is definitely true um, for paints that are just more expensive. So I'm gonna start laying out paint here. My palette is about as clean as I care to get it today. Um, and I'm gonna kinda of go one by one, um, tell you which colors I'm putting out, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So I'm gonna go one by one and just tell you which of each color I'm putting out and why I chose the brand that I did. So circling back to this discussion of different brands of titanium white, what I ultimately have landed on is Williamsburg brand titanium white. I actually never got a chance to use Lafranc before they stopped producing paint, so I can't comment on the likeness to Lafranc, but I've heard other artists say that this is the closest replacement that they found and they're really satisfied with the quality. So this is what I've been opting for. Up next, I have Rembrandt Cadmium Lemon. I think I've gone back and forth between using Winsor & Newton and Rembrandt here. I think just generally I kind of like having a creamier cadmium because kind of like the titaniums, I find they can be a little bit stiff. I'm not putting out much because I'm not working on florals at the moment or anything that would require something this intense, but I like to just have it down on my palette just in case. Next up, I have Winsor Newton Cadmium Yellow Pale. As you might be able to tell, I've had this tube for a while. And this is just another one where I just happened to have the cadmiums. I think it was recommended that maybe all of them be Winsor Newton. Um, so this is what I've stuck with and I've never had any issues with them. Okay, next up I have three super similar cadmiums. I have, oh, let's see if I can actually open this. I have Rembrandt Cadmium Yellow Deep, Rembrandt Cadmium Orange, and then I have Michael Harding, I think this is also Cadmium Orange, yes it is. 
Um, I might also have a Michael Harding Cadmium Scarlet, um, but you'll see this is just one shade deeper than my other Cad Orange. And what I've heard is that while these are all the same substance being used to create the pigment, they're fired to different temperatures. So what happens is the most chromatic version of each individual shade of the cadmium line, it's most chromatic if the pigment was fired to that specific temperature rather than trying to mix the pigments to make it. So that's one reason why it's helpful, for instance, to have cad yellow pale in addition to cad lemon and cad orange in between your cad yellows and your cad red. This is Winsor Newton Cadmium Red. Um, I don't go to this color often, so I'm just recycling a little pile of it that I had before. And then next up, I go for the Permanent Rose and Permanent Magenta combination. And both of these are Winsor & Newton. And I definitely put out more than I put out for the cadmiums. It's just easier to go through these. I'm sure there's a way to choose just one of these to be on my palette, but I haven't done a color chart that really compared them. So for now, I have both, and I just go for the one that seems like it's most likely to produce the color that I need. Then up next, I have my Transparent Oxide Red. This is by Rembrandt. I don't even know if other brands offer the Transparent Oxide colors, but I do know that Rembrandt is known for these, and the colors are super beautiful. I love them anytime I'm doing like early stages of a painting that are meant to be transparent. Um, and this is just Rembrandt Transparent Oxide Brown. And then last up over here, I kind of take my little gradient back toward yellow. This is Rembrandt Transparent Oxide Yellow. This is closest to a yellow ochre, but a transparent version of it. So it starts off a little bit darker. I actually, I've been using these for monochromatic painting. I have a lot of commissions that are based on old black and white photographs. For those, I really like sticking to the monochrome and I tend to prefer grabbing the transparent oxide yellow versus grabbing a tube of yellow ochre. And that's just personal preference. But while we're talking about yellow ochre, I just got this giant tube of Winsor & Newton Yellow Ochre Pale, which is the next color that's going out here. Um, and this is the one that I said was extremely specific. Um, everyone makes a yellow ochre. A lot of companies make yellow ochre light or yellow ochre pale, but Winsor & Newton is the one that seems to make the color that people find the most use out of, specifically if you are doing limited palette work, like a Zorn palette or you just want to use yellow ochre as your primary yellow if you want um, a primary palette. Now with those colors put out, I kind of have to make a decision over how robust I want this palette to be today. I think I will put out a little bit of my Gamblin green gold. I don't know what I'm going to use it for. I just have a feeling that I might want to have it out. This is a color, so I mentioned that Rembrandt makes this color and they look remarkably, like they're interchangeable. The Gamblin Green Gold or the Rembrandt Transparent Yellow Green. They're functionally identical, but it's just much easier to get the Gamblin color than the Rembrandt. So normally for these beautiful transparent colors, I stick with Rembrandt, but for this one, I'd rather just use the brand that I can easily order. Next, I have a gigantic tube of Rembrandt Viridian. Viridian is a semi-transparent color, which I think is partly why I just like having it in Rembrandt. Um, again, just going ahead and kind of sticking with one brand that I like for all the transparent colors that I put down. I have similar feelings about Ultramarine Blue, which is also Rembrandt. Now you'll notice the size of the piles of paint that I'm putting out, they vary somewhat just based on like the size of the tube. You can see like Gamblin has really small um, tube sizes with, with that opening. So it's a really small pile that I put out. Whereas my yellow ochre, my Viridian and my ultramarine blue, those are all pretty large. That being said, I very purposefully didn't put out many cadmiums because it's unlikely that I'm gonna have to really dip into them a whole lot. But 
if I'm gonna put out more of some colors versus others, I always try and put out a whole lot of titanium white, a whole lot of transparent oxide brown, probably a good bit more than I actually put out here. Probably gonna have to replace that pretty frequently. Um, and then a whole lot of ultramarine blue. As a side note, I just realized that I somehow entirely forgot a color that I wanna put on my palette. So I'm going to put that out right now. This is um, a great color whenever I am working on portraits or those monochrome paintings. So I'm just gonna kind of scoot everything over to make some room for this. I'm also gonna just try and make sure that I keep my palette knife super clean in between moving these colors because this is fresh paint and I don't wanna waste it. So you might be wondering why I'm not just putting this other color at the very end and the reason is that most professional artists that I know recommend that you kind of automate and simplify as much as your workflow as possible. And that means knowing where every color is so you never have to hunt for it. So this is the palette layout that I stick to as a default. You know, it could be in the future that I decide that there's just a, a better way for me to lay this out, but in the meantime, this is what what I'm used to, and so this is what I'm going to stick with. I think it's also kind of funny for that reason that I managed to forget to lay out a color, but that is, you know, that's just the way it goes. I think this is also a really good time to reiterate that the only paint wasted is paint that stays in the tube. So I'm definitely putting out a lot of paint here, and I'm also not afraid to lose some of it when I'm scraping things off. I know it's kind of a shame, but at the same time, getting into a stingy mindset when it comes to paint is going to lead you to a stingy mindset when you're mixing colors, which means you probably are gonna put too few colors on your actual painting. I hope this video has been a really helpful insight into why not only I choose the brands that I choose, but I hope this is also a really helpful guide next time you are in the art store and you're trying to decide whether it's time to level up to a premium brand, or maybe you're still a student grade paint um, and you're not really sure how to dive into the artist grade or above. A lot of times, there really is this happy medium between paint that represents the ideal working qualities for the amount of money you're spending. And in my experience, it lies right in these three brands of Winsor Newton, Gamblin, and Rembrandt. Um, if you have experiences with other brands of paint, good or bad, you know, paints, paint brands that you just love and highly recommend, or paints that you found are really great for one application but might be limited in another, or I don't know, maybe even paint brands that people really love that you just don't get what all the hype is about. Share in the comments, because I'm always really curious what other artists' experiences are. And until next time, I hope you stay safe, I hope your families are safe, and I wish you very happy painting. Thanks for tuning in.